yes. Uh, Turn to Revelation chapter 1 and verse uh, 6. Did you get one, Chuck? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. There you go, sorry about it. Uh, Revelation 1, 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God, his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Uh, to him uh, who hath made us kings and priests. Now, in the margin of your Bible, in your margin of your Bible, write down Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. That's the cross reference you want to have first of all. It is kings and priests. And so you want to know the time element that is involved in the matter. Write down this. You should have it in your notes there. But you have uh, kings and priests. The king, uh, and we shall reign with him. We're going to reign with him on the earth for a thousand years. That's a millennium. Not back here in the church age. This is the church age. We're not reigning in the church age. Uh, a Christian in the church age will reign in the millennium. A tribulation saint will also reign in the millennium. Both saints reign. Now, Revelation chapter 5, and let me, let's read the verse and explain it. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. And has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's true with a tribulation saint, and that's true with a church age saint. Now for the tribulation saint to reign, he has to overcome the mark of the beast. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 20. Write it down that way. In order for the tribulation saint to reign with Christ a thousand years, the tribulation saint, that's in that seven year period of time right there on the chart, he must overcome the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 20, let's pick up verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, verse 4. And I saw thrones, underline the word thrones. Those are thrones, those thrones that kings reign on. I saw thrones. I saw, that's John. So God is revealing to John what is taking place? It's a revelation to John. It's, John sees it. It's like watching a movie. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. So they're able to judge. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, underline the word, beheaded. That's how the tribulation saint dies. The tribulation saint, in that period of time, gets his head cut off with a sword or a guillotine of some kind, but he loses his head. Now watch it. For the witness of Jesus, that's what they're doing. They were witnessing, so they lost their head. And for the word of God, so they die for what the book says. It cost them. It ought to cost us. It ought to cost you. That's true of a, a church aid saint as well. Now watch it. Which had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, neither hath received his mark upon the forehead or in the hand. That's a tribulation saint. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So underline it. They lived and reigned, reigned with Christ a thousand years. So in the tribulation, 
if a tribulation saint overcomes the mark of the beast, does not take the mark in the forehead, he gets to reign with Christ a thousand years. Now, back in the church age, taking a Christian. Now, you take your Bible and turn to Timothy. That should uh, be in your notes there somewhere. Second Timothy chapter 2 and uh, Romans chapter 8, two places. Romans chapter 8 in one hand and Second Timothy chapter 2 in the other hand. Now we're going back to a church age saint. That'd be you and me. All right, uh, Second Timothy chapter 2. And let's pick up verse 12, 2 Timothy 2, 12. If we suffer, circle the word if, and write in the margin of your Bible, you don't have to suffer. It's a choice you have to make to suffer for Jesus. It'll cost you something to suffer for him, but you'll have to make a choice. If we suffer, we shall also reign then if you do not suffer you won't reign you can lose it you can lose it you can't lose your salvation your salvation of your soul is secure but the millennial reign with Christ for a thousand years you can lose by not suffering for Jesus now watch it if we deny him you won't suffer for him underline it if we deny him, you won't suffer for Christ. He also will deny us. Deny you what? Deny you a reign. You will not reign with him. He's not talking about salvation now. To make sure that you understand that he's not talking about salvation where he, when he says we, he will deny us he, and he's talking about reigning and not salvation, look what he says in the next verse. If we believe not. See, he said that because he wants you to know that in verse 12 he's talking about a reign. He's not talking about salvation. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. So in case somebody read verse 12 and thought that he was talking about salvation, which he's not, he immediately says in verse 13, if we believe not. Now, did you believe to be saved? Okay, then. What if you stop believing? Look at the verse. Look at the verse. You're still saved. Why? Because you've been born again. You have had a birth, and you're still God's child, whether you stop believing or not. So that verse shows you you can stop believing and still be saved. The salvation of your soul. What will you lose? A reign. You lose a millennial reign. So here, a Christian in the church age can lose, if he does not suffer for Jesus, he can lose the millennial reign for a thousand years. He does not lose his soul salvation. Now, Romans chapter 8. Look at it again. Romans chapter 8. And you want to make sure that you reign with Jesus Christ. Reign with him. So you got to learn how to deny yourself. Deny yourself things that you could have. So you've got to teach yourself self-denial. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and pick up verse 17. Romans, and this day and age, it's hard. Difficult to deny yourself because we got everything. Romans chapter 8 verse 17. Now watch it. And if children, the first if, circle it. If children, if you're saved, if you're saved, if you're God's child, if children, then heirs, then there's an inheritance that's automatic, you can't lose it. And you will have that inheritance, and nobody can take it from you, no matter what you do or don't do, you will have that inheritance. It's automatic, because you're God's child. Now watch it. Heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, so here's a second F. So there's two of them there. If so be that we suffer with him. If you suffer with him, you will get an inheritance. You get one automatically just because you're his child. 
But so you can lose part of your inheritance. Don't lose part of your inheritance. That we may also glorify together. So I'm going to. There's two ifs. One is if you're saved, you have an inheritance. One, if you suffer. If you suffer. <coughs> now, get the key verse. Colossians chapter 3, verse 24. Colossians 3, 24. That's the key verse for a Christian, for you and me. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift to be received and not a goal to be achieved. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. And that's a, a lot of folks in theology get the thing messed up and they think it's a goal to be achieved. It's not a goal to be achieved. It's a gift to be received. Receive a free gift and you got it just like that, by faith. Faith alone. Put your faith in his shed blood in the cross of Calvary right there and he'll save you. You receive a free gift. He died for you, was buried and rose again for your sins. Receive it as a gift. Now, trust in his blood. Now, uh, Colossians chapter 3. Watch what it says here about this inheritance that you can lose. It's not free. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the... Now, underline it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 24. Receive the what? Reward. Reward. So right in the margin of your Bible, right there, this is an inheritance that it is a reward. It's earned. It's earned. It's not a free gift. So it has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with what you do after you're saved. After you're a child of God. It has to do with what? Verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartedly as unto the Lord and not unto man. If you do it for the Lord, he's going to reward you. If you do it for your own glory, your own praise, your own money, or for somebody else, you don't get a reward. But if you do it for the Lord, he's going to reward you. Everything you do. No matter what it is. Now, verse 25. But... He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So can you live like the devil and get away with it? If you live right, can you get away with it? No. <laughs> you, the Lord's going to reward you either way. If you live right, the Lord's going to reward you at the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> and you get a reign with him. See that? So if you live right, the Lord's going to take you up in heaven. And when he comes back, you get a reign with him for a thousand years because you live right and you suffer for Jesus. You'll still go to heaven by living it. So there's some Christians die and go to heaven and they ain't got anything and they don't get a reign. Now, any questions over the passage we just went across? The Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Ask the question. Go ahead. Anything goes, brethren. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter 6 and it looks like in Matthew chapter 6 that uh, this is what they're going to it's going to be like uh, Matthew chapter 6 well, uh, maybe it's 5 uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 okay now uh before we, you get, before I give you that one, turn to the Gospel of John and turn to John chapter 1 and look at verse 12. And we'll tie the two verses together. John 1, 12. Turn there first. John 1, 12. But as many as receive him, to them give it power to become, what? The sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Who is that? That's a Christian. That's a Christian. Okay. Uh, let me give you one more. Turn to 1 John chapter 3 before we turn to Matthew 5. Turn to 1 John 3 and uh, look at these sons of God again. Look at the sons of God, who they are in this age. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 
and look at verse uh, 1, if I can find it, 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called, what? The sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth him not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now underline that next word in verse 2. Now are we the sons of God. Now, why? You believe in Jesus Christ. You believed in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you become a son of God. Now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of what? God. So they'll be called the children of God. So what are they called? They're called peacemakers. They're called the peacemakers. The rest of them are kings and they're reigning. And so you won't suffer for Jesus Christ, but you go to heaven and you get a perfect body, a sinless body, a body that can't die, and an eternal body, and uh, you go through the judgment seat of Christ, and you become like Christ, you come back to this earth, you'll be on the earth, and a representative, you'll be just like Christ on this earth. In a sinless body. But you, but I, I trust you're reigning. But in, to answer the question, you're a peacemaker. Then what's a peacemaker? A peacemaker is the person that, that goes throughout the world and make sure the world lives in righteousness. And it's a forced righteousness. It's like a policeman today. It's a forced righteousness. But that person, remember, that person has a body like Christ had, and then he come back from the judgment seat of Christ, and he is sinless, walking on this earth, sinless. Sinless being. With a spiritual body that he got at the rapture, back here to rapture. Follow that? So he's a peacemaker. So he's going about, and when guy doesn't do right, and doesn't live right, and doesn't do like he ought to do, turn to Matthew chapter 10 and see what that peacemaker does. Matthew chapter 10. It's a forced righteousness with an iron rod. Uh, uh, look at verse uh, 28. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both, now watch it, soul and what? Body. Now that led the Jehovah's Witnesses back in the church age, that led them to believe that the body goes to hell. Your body don't go to hell. Your body goes to the grave. An unsaved man's body goes to the grave. Nobody in this age, your body don't go to hell. Your body goes to the grave. And it's in the grave. You go out there and dig it up tomorrow. And it wouldn't be in hell. Say amen. But in the millennium, in the millennium, Matthew chapter 10, in the millennium, a man goes right straight to hell and his body goes to hell. So here's the peacemakers. When a man's offended... A peacemaker comes and a peacemaker throws that fellow in hell. Literally. Goes in hell body and soul and spirit. Because hell is right on earth. You can see it. It's at the, it's at the bottom of the lake, uh, the Dead Sea. About in Edom. Huh? In the millennium, in the millennium, there's people that have come through the tribulation that are, have physical bodies, and they go through the judgment of nations, and they go, turn to Zechariah, let me give you the scripture, turn to Zechariah chapter 14, turn to Zechariah chapter 14, and see it in scripture. Now, in Zechariah chapter 14, you need to underline some things to get the understanding of the entire chapter. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Beginning at verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord, circle that, day of the Lord. That be the millennium, entire millennium, even over into the great white throne judgment, 
and even overlapping into the rapture. But the day of the Lord basically is a millennial reign of Christ. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided into the midst of thee. Now, verse 2. And I, circle the I, and write God in the margin. I, God Almighty, I will gather all nations. Then God is going to take every nation on the face of this earth, America included, and he's going to gather them together. I will gather all nations. Now watch it. Underline the next two words. Against, against who? Jerusalem. So the entire world will turn against the Jew. That's what's going to happen. Every nation on the face of this earth is going to come together to the battle of Armageddon against the Jew. Write it in the margin of your Bible. This is Armageddon. And all the nations of the world are going to come together against Jerusalem to battle, to fight the Jews. Now, to battle, underline that. And the city should be taken. What city? Jerusalem. The city should be taken, and the house is ravished, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight. He comes back at Armageddon. Write down Revelation chapter 19. That's the battle of Armageddon, Revelation chapter 19. Then shall the Lord go forth to fight against these nations, as when he fought in the day of battle, back in, Josh, in Joshua chapter 10. Fight in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So he comes and lands on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is east Jerusalem, out the eastern gate, which is before Jerusalem on the eastern gate. There it is. <laughs> and the Mount of Olives shall cleave into the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed towards the north, and half of it toward the south. Ye shall flee into the valley and the mountains, and so on down through it. Now, verse 10, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Underline it in verse 9. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. What is that? That's a millennium. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. That's a millennium. Second advent, he come back, he destroyed those nations in the battle of Armageddon, and the Lord is king over all the earth. He's reigning for a thousand years. Now watch it. Um, uh, now let's pick up verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left, everyone that's left after the battle of Armageddon, so the women don't go to the battle, the children don't go to the battle, and some folk don't go to the battle of Armageddon. Everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem. Uh, right, back, right, right beside verse 16, right down verse 2, because that's what verse 2 said. Against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king... Now watch it. The Lord of hosts. So Jesus Christ is reigning in his millennial reign and he's a king on the earth. Now watch it. To keep the feast of tabernacles. Then the law comes back in in the millennium. Now verse 17. It shall be that whosoever will not go up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. Then some folks won't go up. Some folks won't go to Jerusalem and worship Jesus Christ. Even upon them shall be what? No rain. So in the millennium, some folks won't get any rain on them. Now, verse 18. And if the families of Egypt, evidently it's Egypt that won't go, go not up and come not and have no rain, there shall be a plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So in the millennium, they keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and if that nation, Egypt in particular, won't go to Jerusalem and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, they have no rain. So here's people in physical bodies in the millennium. 
So here's the Christians that are back here that have been raptured to heaven. They got spiritual bodies like Christ, went through the judgment seat of Christ, the married supper of the Lamb, come back with Jesus Christ, and they're on the earth too. So you have two people on the earth, those folks that are in spiritual bodies that can't sin and can't die, and then those folks from physical bodies that can die and can sin. Follow that? And then those saints, they are like, uh, they're like policemen, evidently. That's what they're like. But they won't reign with Christ. They'll just be there. And being like Christ, they will go throughout the whole world. And their home is actually New Jerusalem, which hasn't come down from heaven yet. <laughs> their home is actually New Jerusalem, which hadn't come down. It will come down at the end. New Jerusalem will come down from heaven on earth. But New Jerusalem is up in heaven now. Oh, yeah, you get that at the rapture. You'll be able to do all kinds of things. Walk around, go back to New Jerusalem, come back, be on the earth for a thousand years, reigning, and doing all kinds of things. You have a, that spiritual body, although it's spiritual, it has flesh and it has bones, so it looks like this fellow right here. See, it looks like a physical body and has all the enjoyments, eating, Drinking, I mean, you're not not that kind, not drunken, but <laughs> right kind, yes. If they can be saved in the millennium if they go to Jerusalem and worship Jesus Christ. They got to go to Jerusalem and worship Jesus Christ on His throne in Jerusalem. No, Satan's bound for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, the devil's bound for that thousand year period of time. But they still have their own nature that they got from Adam back here in the garden after Adam sinned. Adam sinned and Adam fell. Turn to Ma uh, Genesis chapter 5 and look at verse 2. Genesis chapter 5 and look at verse 2. In the millennium, it's just pure works. You can't see it. You can see it. It's just pure obedience. That's why when you read all those things down through, it's just pure obedience. It's obey, 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 obey. Here's Adam and Eve in the garden. What did he say to them? Did he say, have faith? Come on, did he say, have faith? Or did he say, don't eat? That's pure works. Pure works. No faith involved. Pure works. Don't eat, period. No faith involved. Didn't say if you have faith to believe in nothing. It said don't. It's pure work. Somebody said, well, pure works, yeah. That's Adam and Eve in the garden, pure works. They have to, they have to go once a year in the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they go and believe and worship Jesus Christ on the throne, everything's fine. But if they don't, no rain on them. And they'll rebel at the end of the millennium. There'll be a rebellion of God and Magog at the end. There's a battle here at the end of the millennium and a battle at the beginning of the millennium. One's called the Battle of Armageddon. One's called the Battle of Gog and Magog. They're two different battles. Take place two different times. Two different places. No, it's the same place. It's in Jerusalem. All right. Now, Genesis chapter 5. And look what it says. In verse 2, male and female created him and blessed him and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot sons and daughters. Now I'm blind it, verse 3. In his own what? Lightness. After his what? Then Adam lost the image of God. Adam was created in the image of God and then he lost it. And every man that was born from Adam is created in the image of Adam. We have a fallen nature. We don't have the nature of God. Unless you get the nature of God over here where you're born again and you get his nature, then you get the divine nature. The divine nature comes back 
which is Jesus Christ. It's called the divine nature. Turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter calls that a divine nature. So you actually have two natures. You've got the old nature and the new nature. Where that man there in the millennium has the old nature. Unless he's back here and been born again and get the new nature, you get rid of the old nature at the rapture. Now, that divine nature, uh, somebody give me the cross references in Peter. Maybe it's Second Peter, First or Second Peter. Uh, that divine nature, there it is, Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. So a Christian has two natures. He has a divine nature and he has an old nature. You got them both. It's the old nature that gives us a fit. If I could just follow the divine nature. First, uh, second, uh, Peter chapter 1 verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. The promises are that he died for your sins. The promise was in the, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The promise is Christ shed his blood for you. Precious promises that by these, by these precious promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. There it is. And an escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Underline it. Uh, partakers of the divine nature. So that's the Holy Spirit. That's the nature that Adam lost back there. It's the image of Christ. It is Jesus Christ. So when you receive Jesus Christ, you get that nature back that he lost. But you still got your old nature that come from Adam, and that gives you a fit. You know you got an old nature. If you face yourself, if you're honest with yourself, you know you do. All right, back to Revelation. Revelation chapter uh, 1, verse 6. Revelation 1, 6. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Now, the word priest, priest, uh, that uh, calls for uh, Peter, first or second Peter. Uh, there's that, uh, let me find those priests. Uh, I think it's uh, first Peter chapter, uh, first Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Here's a Christian. A Christian is a priest. Every Christian is a priest. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, pick up verse 5. Now underline it. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house to offer up a, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now take your pen and underline it. And holy what? Holy what? Come on, folks. When I'm in First Peter chapter two, verse five, uh, I'll, I'll let you get there, and I want you to look at it. I want you to see it. First Peter chapter two, verse five. Uh, ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Write it in the margin of your Bible. Every Christian is a priest. Every Christian is a priest. Uh, anybody know anything about Catholicism? They have priests. When real Christianity, every Christian's a priest. Every one of them are. Now, what kind of sacrifices are they to offer up? No, no. What does it say in your Bible? Spiritual sacrifices. What are those sacrifices? Somebody give me three of them. Somebody give me two. Somebody give me one of them. Thanksgiving. Praise the Lord. Give me a verse. What's the real sacrifice you're really missing, folks? There's one in Romans that's a sacrifice you're to present it your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then you're, to, you're a priest, and you're to give God your sacrifice of your body. And it has to do with service. Service. Service ought to serve. 
All right, uh, now back to uh, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God, his Father, to him be glory. Underline that. To him be glory. Write it in the margin of your Bible. Always glorify him. To him be glory. Always give the Lord the glory. Always give the Lord the glory. All right. Uh, and his father, uh, uh, priest, um, kings and priest unto God and his father. No, no, notice it says God and his father. Who, who is it talking about when it says God and his father? Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. When it says God and his father, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to him be glory and what? Be glory and what? Dominion. Dominion. So he has a dominion that is an everlasting dominion, and it's a dominion that covers the entire world. Write down Daniel chapter 7 for dominion. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Now, verse 7. Behold, uh, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. <clears throat> Behold, he cometh with what? Clouds. Now, underline it. Every eye shall see him. Write down Zechariah chapter 14. We just read it. In Zechariah 14, the, all the armies are gathered together to fight him. So every eye shall see him. So here at the advent of Christ... The, all the nations will see Jesus Christ coming back at the advent. Every eye will see him. But here at the rapture, not every eye will see him. It's a mystery. Take your Bible for the rapture and turn to 1 Corinthians. And notice in 1 Corinthians at the rapture, <coughs> it's called a mystery. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And look at verse 51. So at the rapture of the church age saint, uh, not every eye will see him. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. <coughs> Be behold, I show you a mystery. Underline the word mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. So that's the rapture and not the advent. That's not the second advent of Christ, which you just read right there is a rapture. Not the second advent of Christ. Where at the second advent of Christ, every eye will see him. The whole world will see him. All right, back to Revelation chapter 1 now. Verse, pick up verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. They also which pierced him. Now, who pierced Jesus Christ? One of two. One of two people pierced him. Uh, turn to the Gospel of John and turn to John chapter 19. <coughs> It can only be one of two groups that pierced Jesus Christ. John chapter 19, and uh, look at verse 34, and see who is it that's piercing Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John chapter 19, verse 34, and it says, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Who is it there? It's the, Ro it's the Romans. It's the Romans that pierced him. So write it down. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, it says, They that pierced him, it have to do with the Romans. So Rome's going to be around when the Lord comes back again. They'll be running the show. All right. Or take your Bible and turn to Zechariah. And turn to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. So it's one of these two groups. 
probably the first group. Zechariah chapter uh, 12, and pick up verse uh, 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David, who is the house of David? The Jews, the Jews. So right in the margin of the Bible, the house of David is the Jews. And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's going to be Jews, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. The me is Jesus Christ, whom they have pierced, and shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Now look at chapter 13 and look at verse 6. In chapter 13, verse 6. And look at the two verses together. Said, uh, uh, unto whom, uh, unto me of whom they have pierced. Now chapter 13, verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then shall he answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So one of these days, somebody's going to ask Jesus Christ, what are these wounds in thy hands? And he's going to say, when I was wounded in the house of my friends. So uh, the Jews crucified Christ. The Jews are connected with piercing him. And spiritually, spiritually, when I was wounded in the house of my friends, who did Jesus die for? Yeah, we're his friends. So sometimes some of the things we do wound him. Now think about it, brethren. Some of the things we do wounds him, don't it? Don't we? Don't we wound the Lord sometimes? I'm sure we do. I'm sure we do. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And uh, verse uh, 7. Write down, second advent of Christ. All uh, kindred of the earth shall wail because of him, Armageddon. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega. I taught, that's Jesus Christ talking. Alpha, that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Iota, Kappa, Lambda, Mu, Nu, Kasyama, Kern, Pi, Rho, Sigma, Tau, Epsilon, T, Ki, Psi, Omega. Omega is the last letter of the Greek Greek, Greek alphabet. It's terrible. <laughs> but that's what you have. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. So who's talking? It's Jesus Christ. Which is, and which was, and which is to come. Which is, he's alive now. Which was, he was dead. And which is to come, he's coming back. Now unblind it. Who is it? The Almighty. The Almighty. Now you have some uh, notes in your notes there on uh, uh, Revelation 1.8. It gives you several cross references for the Almighty. Jesus Christ is the Almighty God. And uh, there they are. Revelation 4.8. Revelation 11.17. Revelation 15.3. Revelation 16, 7. Revelation 16, 14. Revelation 19, 14. The Almighty. The Almighty. I've no doubt about who it is. Jesus Christ is the Almighty. And then give you several cross-references in the Old Testament. So write it there in your notes. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Almighty God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the the Almighty God. And there's all the cross-references. You can look them up. There's no doubt about it. Now, verse uh, 9. Verse 9. Uh, I, John, who also am your brethren and companion, now watch it, in tribulation and in the kingdom. See it? In tribulation and kingdom. All right. Uh and patience of Jesus Christ, who was in the isle that is called Patmos. If you've got a map in the back of your Bible, you should be able to find the island of Patmos. 
it uh, if you have a have a, I don't have enough map in there uh, Patmos and it's out there in the middle of that uh, ocean there just off of the coast of the Israel that out there in the isle called Patmos maybe you can see it it's uh, not a very big island small island there all right now here's what you want to get notice it says for the word of God. So why was on, uh, John on the Isle of Patmos? For the book, for preaching the book, for preaching God's book. So the Bible is what cost him to be put on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, well, tradition says it was a salt mine. The tradition says it was a prison of a salt mine. Yeah, that's tradition. Uh, I don't know if that's actually so or not. But he's there for preaching the book. He's there for the Word of God. Folks, this book ought to cost you. Now, now write it down in your notes. The Word of God should cost the Christian something. The Word of God ought to cost the Christian something. It cost uh, John to be on the Isle of Patmos. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, write down Revelation. The judgment seat of Christ is coming. You know the Antichrist is coming. You know Jesus Christ is coming back. You know a lot of the future. You got the spirit of prophecy. All right, verse 10. I was in the spirit. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, you want to get that one. Because write it down, it's not Sunday. Most of your commentaries say it's Sunday. It's not Sunday. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, write down 2 Peter chapter 3, and let's see what the Lord's Day is. Turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And see what the Lord's Day is. You can find it all throughout the Old Testament. It's in several places, we just read it in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1, said on the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. Now, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, But, now underline the next four words, the day of the Lord. There it is. I was on the Lord's day. It's the day of the Lord. I was, uh, but, the day of, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. So the day of the Lord goes all the way over to here. Goes all the way over to here. Look at verse 8 in the chapter. The same chapter. What does it say? I, I lost my place now. Somebody read me verse 8. So, a thousand years is one day. And it says it in the same verse. So you want to have verse 10 and verse 8. Verse 10 and verse 8. Showing you the day of the Lord's a millennium. So when John is transferred, John is taken from way back here in 90 AD and carried up in time and John sees the book of Revelation take place. John sees it take place. He's up there in the book of Revelation and is watching the thing take place. And sees it. That's why you see the expression throughout the book of Revelation. And I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw. And it goes from Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. It just must be there 20 times. I saw, I saw, I saw an angel. I saw this, I saw this. And so John is taken forward. And just like he sees the thing play, take place in time. And he starts writing. And I can imagine, can't you imagine the fellow seeing what if you was back in the year 90 A.D., like John, on the Isle of Patmos, and then carried you up here and put you out on the highway out here, stuck you out there on the highway at night. And you're out here standing on the highway at night, and you are you're come up from 90 A.D., and you're standing there, and here comes this light down the road. And it looks like it's two big eyes. And then it goes, Whoa! and then they turn red. 
and it screams by you and you knew it was going about 100 miles an hour. Wouldn't you have a fit trying to write that thing down? <laughs> When you have a fit trying to write it down, the Lord says, now write it. So when the Lord shows John all that stuff, he sees it, <coughs> and sometimes he won't even let him write it. There's one, there's one case over there where he sees something, and the Lord says, can't write that, John. Can't write that one. That's too much, man. Don't even write that one. But for most of it, he sees it, and then he just writes down what he sees and describes it as he would see the thing. Now, look at Revelation chapter 1. And look at verse 19. We we'll skip down to verse 19. Yeah, so John is transferred into time. Verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen. He saw verse 11. The seven churches. And the things which are. That's chapter 14 through 19. And the things which shall be after. That's chapter 20 through chapter 22. Verse 19 gives you the division of the book of Revelation. Now, back up to verse 11. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou hast seen, write in the book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, and to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So he sends all to those seven churches, seven of them. And those seven churches are in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation. And you should have those uh, seven churches marked. Now, verse 12. And I turned to see the vision, and it spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, here are those uh, seven golden candlesticks. And uh, a golden candlestick is mentioned in Exodus chapter 25, verse 31, and Numbers, and Exodus 26, and Leviticus, and Exodus, it's given that seven golden candlesticks. Now I'll draw you that golden candlestick. Now after studying it, and you can study it on your own and come up with it too, uh, by reading all those cross references, that golden candlestick had a main stem off of it like that. And had three coming off on each side. And it was made out of gold. It was a golden candlestick. And had, uh, had three lights on each one of them. Had three, uh, lights on each one of the golden candlesticks. And if you study the thing out, that thing, and that, now look at verse 20. Revelation Chapter 1, verse 20. So here's seven golden candlesticks. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven of them. <laughs> now, look at verse 20. Verse 20 in the, in the verse. And the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the right hand of the, him, the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are, 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 what? All right, so, so each one of these candlesticks is, is a church. Each one of them, so there's seven of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So each one of them is a church. So this candlestick is a church. 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 And then he names all the seven churches. All the seven churches are given. Where is Christ? Christ is walking in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Christ is walking in the midst of the seven candlesticks. You all follow that? Okay. Okay. Get verse 20, look at verse 20, and you'll see it. Verse 20, and the mystery of the seven stars. The seven stars are what? The seven stars are the seven angels. There are seven angels. Each church has an angel. The mystery of the seven stars which are solace in the right hand and the seven golden standalsticks. The seven stars are. What are the seven stars? 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So each church has what? An angel. So each church has an angel. An angel here. 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 And an angel here. So each church has an angel. Seven of them. And the candlesticks stand for a church. So there's seven candlesticks. And Christ is in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Pardon? This thing here is a thing in the, tri in the tribulation. What you're reading here is in the tribulation. You can spiritualize it and make it here, but Christ is here with us too. Christ is universal. Christ is, he doesn't give up on the tribulation saints just because you and I went to heaven. <laughs> you and I went to heaven, but he don't give up on the tribulation saint. He still loves the tribulation saint and deals with the tribulation saint. He loves us, but we went to heaven, but Christ is still here in the tribulation saint. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He's there with the tribulation saint as well as with us. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> see? So, we're gone, but that don't mean Christ is gone. Christ is here, still here in the Holy Spirit. Doing the work in the tribulation. Alright, let's get on down to verse 12 and then we'll quit. And I turned to see the voice of him that uh, spake with me, and being turned, I saw the seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of those seven churches, because a candlestick is a church, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man. Now let's quit right there, because verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 all go together. So if you have a blue marker, mark verse 13 through verse 18. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about one person. All three verses, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, are all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll have to, because he's so precious, we don't want to give him just a few minutes. We want to give him a lot of time. Amen? So we'll quit there with verse 13. All right, any questions?